All right, lastly, this line tells the window, make yourself the key window and visible. Key window essentially means you're the one that responds to finger touches, um, and visible means show yourself. And then we return yes, signifying the application did finish loading with options, launching with options. Yeah? If you didn't do that, your uh, application would show that you wouldn't respond to it. Uh, well, let's see. So which, which, if you didn't do that, define that. If you didn't do uh, the self window and uh, make key and visible. So this one here? And not those two lines, just the bottom one. Oh, just this one. Yeah. Indeed, now it does even less, right? <laughs> so that's what it does. So and admittedly, for time's sake, I'm not testing all of our questions sometimes, but this is absolutely good practice. Like, when in doubt, just try it. Um, save your work, but certainly try it. Good question. All right, so what else is in this file? Well, thankfully, a whole bunch of stuff we're going to delete in a second. But just so you know where some of the magical behavior is coming from, notice that the, uh, app, the UI app delegates class that we're descending from also has some other methods. Application will resign active. And the comments essentially define this. But now there's backgrounding apps in iOS, whereby you hit the home button and then the thing disappears. You have the ability to respond to those events. So just as JavaScript is very much an event-oriented language, so is Objective-C in this case. So you can do something there. Did enter background after that has actually happened. Uh, application will enter foreground right before it comes back up. So there might be things you want to do, like the mail app. You don't want it checking your mail in the background necessarily, but the moment I re-click the icon and bring it back, maybe Apple wants it to then recheck the mail server for efficiency. So you have this ability to respond to these events. Application will terminate here too. If the user is trying to force quit your application, um, you have the ability, or rather, if you're trying to quit the application, you have the ability to intervene at the last second. But there are constraints. If you kind of try bi biting your time and spend 30 seconds doing something, cleaning something up, you're going to get killed by the OS. You have, I think, five seconds maximally, and that's actually a little high. So this is not meant for long-winded operations. This is for super simple, super simple cleanup, like quickly save the high scores, or quickly update the settings, or something simple like that. But for now, I can delete all of that, so that now my application is whittled down to relatively um, few lines of code. So what you'll see in the printout here today and on the website, the application I called single view is literally the result of my creating this template, then ripping out everything that you don't need to care about initially. So if you want, you can reread through that code just to focus on the germane things. Um, but if you start with the fresh template, you'll get a lot more detail. Any questions? Yeah, Zach. Good question. Um, Does that all live in the nib file? Good question. What's the relationship between the nib file and the .m file? Short answer is it depends um, on the template and on your own design decisions. Generally, the nib contains your user interface or a subset thereof. And by user interface, I mean where are the buttons, where are the text fields, where are the scroll bars and the like. All of that, though, can be implemented in code. And you can delete the nib file and do all of that in code. Some of the templates, even that Apple provides, uh, do all nib-based UI, or they do all code-based UI, or an amalgam of the two. It really depends. And this is slightly one of these religious things where um, some people just hate using Interface Builder. Uh, interface Builder is just the jargon that refers to the drag and drop interface inside of Xcode. It used to be a separate program years ago. Um, some people prefer all code. I think, frankly, sometimes it's just easier to start doing it with Interface Builder and then do a few tweaks in code, but it's a design decision. But you can go into the .dot file and like change variable, like, like change the label. Yes. Oh, absolutely. If you drag and drop things into the nib file, you can then programmatically change what you did in code. They're not mutually exclusive, but the nib is typically loaded first. Good question. Um, you can think of it, um, the nib is technically supposed to be a serialized object. So if you think of your user interface as an object in memory, the nib file, even though it's XML, is like the result of converting it to a crazy long cryptic string so that you can unserialize it later and reconstruct that same user interface. All right, so let's make this ATM and we get to introduce the event handling model of iOS and something called actions and outlets. All right, so here we go. I'm going to go to, um, oh, and do be careful, like I just screwed up. If you hit Command N for new, it asks you to choose a template for a file. That's not what I want. Um, Command Shift new gives me a new project. Or if that's confusing, just go to the file menu and make sure you explicitly choose new project, not new file. 
and then you'll get the right templates. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start with a single view application because it'll give me a little functionality like rotation and whatnot. I'm going to call this ATM. I'm going to leave all of that checked as before. Click OK, or rather next, put it on my desktop for now. And here we go, back to the same starting point that we had before. So I want to implement an ATM, and you saw a glimpse at the interface earlier. So let's dive right into the interface and then worry about how to implement the model and the controller itself after that. So I'm going to go into my nib file. So on the left hand side here, I have viewcontroller.nib. Um, I just have one uh, nib. That's fine, because I'm going to have one interface. So let's do some fluffy stuff first. Let me click on the background here. Let me change the background from being gray to white. All right, so now it looks a little less boring, or maybe more boring, depending on your perspective. Um, now let me start laying some things out. And I'll try to zoom in and out as needed to uh, make this clear as to what I'm doing. So I first want a label. I, want to, I kind of modeled this in my head after like an old school calculator with the little readout on the top. So I'm going to go ahead and drag and drop a label at the top of the file there. And I'm going to say this is where the amount is going to go. Um, that's just a placeholder. It's going to become numeric, but just to keep my, myself sane, I'll do that for now. Let me increase the font size to, let's say, 24 there. And let me just drag here. So kind of like Photoshop and InDesign, if familiar with those products, you can drag. And then it kind of has guidelines to just propose. Why don't you let go there so it's not too close to the edge of the glass so a human finger can still interact with it OK? I'm going to go ahead then and center it here, uh, rather right align it like a calculator would be, or an ATM in this case. So now I have my text field. Now we're going to see in a moment how I can programmatically edit the contents of that string from being amount to being like dollar sign zero or something like that. But now let's do some buttons for the mechanics of the thing. So I'm going to drag and drop this button here. It's suggesting where I put it, but I can override this if I want. And I can absolutely make these things prettier. You can add skins these days and gradients and even graphics and the like. But we'll just keep it more focused on code for now. This is going to be the number 9 over there. I'm going to just copy and paste this and drag it onto the other side. This will be 7 over there. Copy and paste this. Notice it's figuring out the centering for me, so that's nice. This is the kind of stuff that UI builder, uh, interface builder just makes easier. But you could do this all in code. But now I want to do something else. Um, this is slightly, um, this is some forethought here. So I'm scrolling, 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 because I never remember where it is. And there it is. So it turns out that the thing I just dragged here, the number seven, let me go up to the identity. Um, this is the identity inspector up here. Um, notice that because I've clicked on the button and I've chosen that inspector, it's telling me what class this little widget is. So I drag and drop this button. That's a, a specific type. It's a UI button. That happens to descend, I know, from the documentation from UI view. And this is only to say that because it's a UI view, it's got some standard information inside of it, uh, besides font size and all this fluffy stuff. One of those details is something called a tag. So I'm actually going to specify I want this, data, this button to be tagged with an integer, the number 7. So I can uniquely identify it later when the user touches this button, independent of the aesthetics. So notice, this is fundamentally different. This is the difference between view and really the model here, where the UI button is a model class. I want there to be a numeric piece of data associated with this button in addition to the aesthetic string that coincidentally is on top. And I can make this distinction even more explicitly. Suppose this were a really annoying ATM, I could say 7 there, just to make more clear the duality of a machine-readable number and a human-readable string. So that's what's called a tag, and it's just a property of the UI view class. So I'm going to quickly do that for 8. Let me change its tag here to be 8. And let me change its tag here to be 9. This is not something you always have to do. This is just because I thought this through, and I realized I want to touch any of 9 or so buttons. I need to be able to determine with the same method which button the user touched. Yeah. It is an int called tag, and I can use it whatever, however I want. Okay. It's typically used with enum constants if I were doing it in code. So, so it's not like an ID in an HTML tag? It's not a unique ID. There can be duplicates, it's so that, hence the name tag. So let me do this quickly now. I'm going to copy and paste these three buttons here. Let me quickly change this to 4, to 5, to 6. Let me quickly change their tags by scrolling down here. Uh, tag, this is going to be 6. This tag is going to be 5. This tag is going to be 4. All right, and now let me, one more time, copy, paste. 
All right, this is going to be 1, this is going to be 2, this is going to be 3. Now I just quickly have to change this, 3. This is why, at this point, code with a loop would actually be kind of compelling. Um, but this is just one-time configuration. All right, and then I need one more row of buttons, let's say. And this is going to be 0 in the middle. And let me give it a tag of 0. And then this guy here, let's call this clear. Let's call this deposit. And just to be fancy, let me change my text color to be, uh, let's say, fern. OK. We've got a 99 cent app coming here. All right. And, all right. Um, turns out these tags won't matter, so I'm just going to leave them as 0. But as we'll see in a moment, it's actually immaterial. So I've got that. Now let me do one more thing. I want to know my total account balance always. So let me go ahead and put a label down here. Call this uh, balance. Let me go ahead and stretch it out to be the whole width. Let me go and change the font size to be as big as the other one, 24 point. Stretch this out further over here. Center this. And actually, we'll just say 0 initially. Make it a little taller. And then just so I have a little label to remind me of what that is, I'm just going to say balance in small text there. OK, so that's it. This is the value of something like Interface Builder. Ugly though this is, I mean, that was much quicker than I could have done it in code, figuring out the various layouts and the like. Know that there exist uh, built-in features in Xcode, whereby if I want to support a left-right rotation, I could actually tweak the definition of these things, locations, to say, if that's OK. If it rotates, just grow to expand the screen or the like. So it doesn't have to all get oriented in like the top left corner quite ugly fashion. So realize there are those features as well. But the more interesting part now is how do I actually implement the rest of this program? Well, let me go ahead and do this. I need some way of maintaining someone's account balance. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to go up to New. Uh, let's say, let's right click on here. Let's go to New File. I want to create a model class. Now, what's a model class? It really depends. Just like in CodeIgniter, you can create a model to represent a student or a course or a professor or whatever you want. I want to represent something like an account balance. So I'm going to choose under iOS, an Objective-C class. I'm going to click Next. I'm going to call this Account. I'm going to tell it to be a subclass of NS Object. I'm going to click Next. It's going to ask me where to save it. That's fine. I want to save it inside the ATM project. And voila, what I now get over here and I'll put it alphabetically at the top, is a generic class called account. Now, what do we need to associate with a user's bank account? Keep it simple. The balance, like how much money do they actually have? So what I'm actually going to do then is inside of the interface here in the .h file, I'm going to go ahead and say, all right, well, a account is going to have a property. I don't know what attributes it's going to have yet. It's going to be an unsigned long, long, value called balance. Now, because this is a long, long, um, should it be a copy or a sign based on last week's conversation? What do you do with primitives usually? Right, so, OK, the opposite. So it was a sign. Copy is used for generally pointers or strings where you want a true copy. With a sign, it suffices just to copy the raw bits because it's a primitive. And this, again, just pertains to how synthesize is going to behave. Give me a setter that just does a raw copy of bits, nothing fancy. Um, in addition, non-atomic will give me an ever so slight performance benefit so that it doesn't worry about multi-threaded code. And that's it. This gives me a property called balance associated with a class called account. Now let me give myself a little bit of functionality so that I can actually use this account. And to do that, in my M file, I'm going to go ahead and say at synthesize. And the property name is going to be balance. And it knows that. Equals underscore balance. And it even knows that. Enter semicolon. And now let me go ahead and create an init method here. So I'm going to do id init, just like we did earlier, even though I'm writing it on the fly this time. So if self gets super init. And again, this is boilerplate code that you should almost always write when creating an init method. I'm going to go ahead and do self.balance gets 0, and then return self. In other words, when the account itself is constructed, initialize your balance to 0. As per our earlier conversation, I could do underscore balance gets 0, or I can use the property. I'm just going to get into the habit of using the property. 
the setter in this case. So that's it for an account balance. I just needed a model class to represent an account so that I can actually now do something uh, with regard to the notion of money. So what do I next want to do? Well, I can pretty much leave alone the app delegate because I'm going to relegate almost all of my interesting code to the view control 